Good afternoon and welcome to Rebooting Education in the Post-Pandemic Era, sponsored by the Hoover Education Success Initiative at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. This series is the outgrowth of a set of essays about the challenges and opportunities for improving public education coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic, how to improve our schools in the post-pandemic era, which can be found on the HESI homepages on the Hoover website. This six-part series runs weekly at this time through October 20th. Today's topic is, can we stop the clock replacing seat time with mastery? So let me introduce myself and our panelists today. My name is Steve Bowen. I'm the Deputy Executive Director for State Leadership at the Council of Chief State School Officers. In that role, I direct the activities of our membership services, leadership academy, and data information systems teams, and oversee the development and implementation of programs and services designed to support the leaders and staff of our state education agencies. I'm really pleased to be joined with our panel today. First up is Dr. Chad Geston, served as a superintendent of Phoenix Union High School District since the fall of 2015. Under his leadership, Phoenix Union has launched six new schools, including a gifted and talented academy, a digital academy, and the Phoenix Coding Academy. Phoenix Union has seen tremendous increases in graduation rates, scholarship totals, and college matriculation rates since 2015. So welcome, Dr. Gaston. Thank you. Don, Don Shelby is joining us, the former CEO of San Joaquin A+, and former Deputy Director for K-12 Education at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, 1992 Superintendent of the San Carlos School District. Shelby sponsored the first charter school in California, widely recognized as a leader in public education and, charter, and the charter school sector. He's the founder and CEO of Aspire Public Schools. And last but not least, uh, Margaret Mackey Raymond is the program director for education at the Hoover Institution, guiding the expansion of education, research, policy analysis, and engagement at the institution. She's also the founder and director of the Center for Research on Education Outcomes at Stanford University, which studies efforts to improve student results in US K-12 education. So our game plan today is we're gonna do a little Q&A with this panel for about 35 minutes, and then we'll turn to audience questions. If you'd like to pose a question, please use the question format in Zoom. All questions will be screened for clarity and repetition. So be clear and don't repeat yourself. And uh, we look forward to the lively hour ahead. So let's dive right in. I'm gonna start off uh, with you, Mackie. Um, in that recent series of essays, uh, you were advocating for eliminating the Carnegie unit in K-12 public schools. So tell us what that is exactly and why you're so negative about it. Thank you, we need to move on to something, okay. something different. Well, okay, thank you. And thank you for that nice introduction of all of us. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, so the Carnegie unit actually began at the university level by Andrew Carnegie, who was concerned about having equivalent depth of, uh, of instruction across elite universities in the United States. He was very concerned that graduates be equivalently prepared. And so they wanted to make sure that basically the same content would be covered in equivalently named courses. Anthropology 101 would be the same everywhere. The way that he did that was to assign a unit of time an hour uh, of which uh, each university would commit that a course would consist in that case of 80 classroom hours. That practice uh, ended up filtering down into high school. And that has, I think, a number of really important uh, problems with it. It's also a problem at the higher education level, but particularly in high schools. Um, the, the unit is really just a, a unit of time, and there's, it's an it's a empty vessel. There's nothing that guarantees what's actually in the hour. And that sets up a lot of different incentives. Um, it's easy, then, to think about lightening the hour a little bit content-wise in order to address perhaps less prepared students. And so what you end up with, even within a state, is a wide range of what a course that has a similar name might actually consist of. There are obvious implications for how well we're preparing high school students if that's in fact the way that we're measuring the quality of the experience that they're having. Um, there's another problem and it's more generic and that is that um, the measure of time is actually an input and we know 
from a large range of empirical evidence that inputs are not good predictors of what happens with students. And so instead of looking at inputs, we are recommending that we shift the focus to actual outcomes and figure out what it is that kids learn as a result of being in those classes. And so that's the basis of the conversation that we're going to have today. All right, so Chad, I'd like to come to you next. Uh, you're building one of the most innovative school districts in the country, entirely high schools in Phoenix. Uh, tell us a little bit about your experience with this concept of seat time and its suitability uh, for the students you serve. How are you thinking about that? Yeah, so I'm uh, here in the city of Phoenix. We are the high school system. We're a unique, uh, unique system. Uh, I think in, in good and bad ways. It's nice to specialize in high school, uh, but we we don't have K-8s. Those are partner districts to ours. But we are able to specialize uh, in high schools. And we have a, a very um, interesting and I think broken relationship with seat time. Uh, we, we wanna think about high schools differently. We wanna design high schools differently. And ultimately we wanna, we wanna create a better product. Um, and the product being our graduates and graduates that, that leave high school truly ready to uh, engage and excel in college, career, life, and, and beyond. Um, and as you heard Mackie say, it's, it's not about the inputs, it's about the product. And what we've learned is two things. One is, as we've launched and designed new schools, we've been building a, a, an aggressively growing a portfolio of schools, small specialty schools, you heard a little bit in the intro, uh, computer, pro, uh, computer coding high schools, um, police and fire high schools, bioscience engineering high schools, um, and even rethinking large comprehensive high schools and breaking them into small academies. And, and what we're finding is that these new innovative models don't fit with seat time uh, and don't fit with Carnegie Unix. And, and I think that's, that's twofold. Number one, not every student learns at the, in the same way at the same pace. And what we have to focus more of our time on is, is mastery, is kids that uh, master certain concepts. Not, uh, it's not about how much time you sit uh, in a seat, it's, uh, it's how much you learn. And what we've found, secondly, is that we've, as we launch new schools, um, our, our state systems aren't keeping up with us either. And as I've shared uh, very, very publicly, that um, in some of our new models, the bell schedule and the seat time that we submit to the state is not actually the one that we follow in our schools. And we found that the only way to run high schools of the future is to actually, um, you know, is to, is to play the game, but, but focus uh, more on mastery and product and not, not the process. And uh, happy to share more about that as we go on today. That's great. Can, can I ask a quick uh, follow-up question before I go to Don? Absolutely. Um, can you, uh, because at least the, the audience that I work with, the members that I work with are state policymakers, is there a state policy piece you would suggest that would solve this challenge you have where you're following the law, but kind of doing your own thing? I mean, what would you ask state policymakers to do who, are, who may be viewing this today? Yeah, certainly. I think there are um, there are a couple of ways to go at this. One, we uh, we did work over the last couple of years here in Arizona to pass to pass a new uh, House bill, uh, twenty eight sixty two. For those uh, who would like to look at it, and it's a uh, it's a, essentially a seat time flexibility bill. Uh, we, we called it an innovation zone. Uh, that's not really what it is. It's a way to say that school systems can spend up to fifty percent of our time. Um, you know, providing instruction unconnect, not connected to actual minutes in classrooms and can focus more on internships, project-based, accelerated learning. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I do think that you can legislate flexibility within, within seat time. I also think the second thing that, that state legislators, but even departments of education can look at is, is graduation requirements and how do you, you know, how do you fold that? How does seat time interplay with number of credits um, and graduation requirements as well? And so I think if you look at both of those, it provides us a glimpse into how we can we can legislate this issue. Right. Yeah. So I remember dealing with this in Maine where you actually had the seat time requirements in state statute. They weren't even in regulation, they were actually in the, in the statute book. So anyway, I appreciate that. So um, Don, let's go on to you. You were an early pioneer in California, creating Aspire Public Schools into a highly successful network of schools operating in some of those underserved communities of the state. What were your views on the Carnegie unit when you started Aspire and how have those views changed over time? 
Yeah, thank you so very much. And one, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, we played by the rules in the early stages of the charter movement in California and elsewhere, but quite frankly, in California, to engage the kind of public support we felt we needed as a public school of choice, we we had to demonstrate that our youngsters could achieve in the same ground rules everybody else had. Same level of funding, same kind of policies, uh, same kind of what, what I would call restrictions. You know, I, I uh, in looking at it, I felt like a little bit of a one-arm paper hanger. You know, I could get this done, but I saw early on that I was, that I was doing it in a structure that I didn't quite fully believe in, in terms of, you know, time as the constant. So uh, over the years, particularly in working with the urban communities we are working with, it, it, became, um, it became clear that we were tying our own hands. So here's what I mean by that. You know, I'm 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 gonna I'm I'm gonna go back to my, you know, doctoral program in curriculum instruction and assessment, and talk about common places of curriculum, and those common places are time, space, and grouping practices, and those are variables rather than constants, and this constant of an hour a day, five days a week, you got to get done what you have to get done. You know, we saw early on that it would be so much better could we indeed vary time, vary place, vary grouping practices around the interests and needs, ambitions, and times of kids. You know, and um, and to really do what we wanted to do, which is allowing kids to do what they love and earn what they need, we needed. We needed to start blurring the lines pretty significantly. And not only blurring the lines around the way we used time, but the way we blurred the lines between work, higher ed, and high school, early college, high school models. Mm -hmm. So we started shifting away from that. And the way we began to shift away from it, and the way we're doing this now in the Central Valley of California is to look to what um, to what Chad was describing, which is in California, there's an alternative school model that you know gives you some leeway from the uh, Carnegie unit play and are utilizing that delivery system much more effectively to the youngsters that we are serving either directly in schools or indirectly in, uh, in helping them get designed and implemented. Uh, you guys are making me think about uh, my experience here in Maine. I, I was the chief here in Maine before coming to CCSSO, and, and we did quite a lot of work around competency-based and trying to move that forward in districts of innovation, chatted the way you, you described it, that kind of legislation. I will tell you that one of the challenges in addressing this is the Carnegie unit is so embedded into the system, like at the DNA level, and it really, you know, so many of the other pieces flow from that, our grading practices, the way we organize kids for instruction, teachers, how teachers are scheduled through the day and the time they have with kids. I mean, so many pieces in it. At least my experience when you started to talk to the public about this, you'd be like, well, look, school worked for me. I, it seems like you're like actually disassembling the entire structure to do this. How do you guys, we've talked a little bit about the state side. How have you thought about how you communicate this to parents, families? They all went through a system with Carnegie units. They understand it. We all understand what fourth grade is like. How do you get the, how do you move on that front in helping people to understand why we need to do something different here? I'm happy to open up to anybody who wants to jump on that. I'm happy to jump in just really quickly. And I, I, I think, you know, Don got at, I think it's, it's giving very specific examples and actual stories of children. And what, I think what we hear from parents uh, all across the country is this rallying cry for individualized learning. And my my child needs his or her own pathway and pacing. And uh, that's not what we're offering in America today. 
um, largely. Uh, and, and so I think number one, it's connecting to with parents that if you're asking for individualized learning, then you're asking for different time and space and place uh, and grouping. And you can use very clear examples from the elementary school level, kids that need to go faster in some areas, kids need to go slower in some areas. Um, and then you move that into the middle school into the high school level. I know, I know for high school, one of the greatest examples that, that we use is we launched a computer programming high school. And our, our goal is to produce the greatest coders, programmers, cybersecurity high schoolers in the country. And you're not going to do that in a Carnegie unit when you get 55 minutes a day to do computer programming because you have 55 minutes for English and 55 for math. You can't do that. Um, when, when you can find ways to focus on mastery, you can then reinvest that time into new skills. And, uh, and so I, I do think that when parents understand concrete examples, that uh, it makes a lot of sense. I'd like to just add on to that. Uh, one of the things that Chad mentions for the Oak Weekly, but I think is really important, is that he was able to construct a new system because he was constructing a new school. And I think the challenge that many districts uh, face today is that the discussion is always what happens at the margin and how do you marginally change from a Carnegie unit based system to something else. And my recommendation has always been really leave that alone, start over over here. It'll take you a year or two longer to get the system designed and ready to go but it's gonna be much cleaner than what, what nightmare you're setting yourself up for by trying to shift from A to B. You know, I, I wanna uh, jump in as well, Steve. Chad, you and I have, um, have never met, yet I feel like right after we're done with this, uh, with this conversation, we should join up. I think you and I could be the, uh, <laughs> the hall of notes of doing away with the Carnegie unit. <laughs> And, and we could redo their hit song. I can't go for that to stand for the for the Carnegie unit itself. So I, I, I want to share a little bit about about how the change process is is taking place in the area where I am. So we we uh, we live in a, in in the Central Valley of California, you know, a 300 mile long valley where most things are grown. And what we are noticing when we survey our community is, uh, and we did it more recently, is that 73% of our uh, voters who are parents and adults rate the ability of our schools to prepare local people for starting a career in a family in the county as low. Like they want really big change. And big change for them is, as I shared earlier, blur the line. Youngsters want to leave high school with a meaningful certification, a paid work experience, and the skills they need to either get out with an AA uh, and on to a BS. But when you start to think about how you give a youngster an opportunity for early college work in, a, in an area that's going to provide meaningful work in our area, health careers, ag, education, logistics. You can't start thinking about the Carnegie unit as unalterable. And so when parents say, this is gonna give my youngster a better chance to, to earn a family sustaining income here in the area, we're all for it. So it's, it's sort of helping reprioritize the way time is used by more formally prioritizing what matters to your community. So we talked a little bit about some of the barriers and I've, I've got a couple of others I wanna have you talk about, but what, what, what do you attribute the staying power of the Carnegie? Like, why are we still, I mean, this is like a hundred year old or at least uh, sort of structure. Again, that's become very elemental to our system. How do we account for the staying power of this model that we're still talking about this in 2020, doing away with this system? Well, What's the keeping it in place? The history of state education systems is not one of rapid evolution and innovation. So can we just start with that as a, yeah. as a, so a, a founding yeah. premise? Um, two, 
Um, I, I think that the, the comment that you made earlier, Steve, that this thing, it, the roots of this thing are incredibly embedded all the way through yep. to the state legislature, all the way through to the state university systems, you name it. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty pernicious plant. And if you're mm -hmm. gonna just declare it a weed and you wanna get rid of it, um, you know, there's, there's lots of tendrils there that you're gonna have to sort of think about and pay attention to, yep. which is why I actually am much more in favor of sort of starting over with something else where everybody just acknowledges we're aging this out and we're gonna go forward with something new because at least we know we don't have the root system that's gonna come back and grab us. And I think one of the other, I, I think one thing that we learned during the pandemic was that we've we've essentially built a nation and an economy on adults going to work eight to four um, while their kids go to school so that we can keep the economy moving. And we saw, right, the, the slowing and the, challenges economically during the pandemic. And I think that when we start to think about learning can take place anytime, anywhere, mm -hmm. uh, that's a challenge to certain industries. Yep. And, and, and I think we need to find a way to paint a much different picture that just because we want to get away from Carnegie units doesn't mean that, you know, parents don't get to go to work uh, from eight to four every day. And, and, you know, I think that's a challenge that we've had telling parents, your kids can learn anytime, anyplace. And uh, we've heard from business and industry saying, hey, we're excited about this, but can we work together uh, to make sure that we're not having an economic impact? Yeah, and it, it feels like the unit of measure is important to all of these post-secondary folks. And I, you know, I, I remember, again, to, to my days in Maine, some of the pushback from parents being concerned that the higher education community has, you know, has sort of built their system in understanding how Carnegie units and they, you know, the kids do their transcripts and, the, you know, to what degree, and this, is, this popped up in, in one of the questions in the chat, to what degree do we need to engage higher education? And Chad, to your point, the business community in helping us build a coalition and thinking about some new ways to measure the progress of these kids and their readiness for post-secondary experience. If we're not gonna use this, how do we build a, a sort of big tent here around a, a kind of another approach, given that these, as you just said, Chad, both higher ed and the employer community are kind of wedded into this rooted system uh, that Mackie was just describing. Well, I think, I, yeah, I can, oh no, go for it, Mackie, no, please. No, Chad, go ahead. No, I was just saying, I, I, I mean, I do think we just need to acknowledge that the, the, the post-secondary system of admissions and credits is intricately linked to, to this K-12 yeah. system. And I think first just calling that out and starting to, uh, convene. I know in Arizona, it's been, uh, we're a fortunate in some ways that we only have three in-state universities and one major private. So we only have four, and from an in-state perspective, only four universities to work with. And so as we launch new schools, a bioscience high school that's completely separate from Carnegie units, um, you know, it's project-based, it's problem-based, kids aren't graduating with the same types of courses, um, but what we've been able to do is work with the universities to say, but we're sending you a product that looks much, looks much different. Um, and, and therefore, it's not about these Carnegie units and these credit systems. It's about the product that we're sending. And I, I use that only as an example, because I think I think these high schools across the country that have very unique curriculum are sending kids to and through college at much, fa much faster rates. So we shouldn't be afraid of this model. We should embrace mm -hmm. this model. Adding on to that, you know, let's let's admit that the Carnegie unit isn't working very well at the higher education level either. The signal that universities are getting yeah. is not actually a, a pure signal at all. There's a lot of noise in that. And so the, the idea that we could shift, as I hope we are going to in this conversation at some point, from a, a unit of, of attendance, essentially, to a unit of what kids actually know, sets us up for a much different integration of the two systems as Don was talking about and as Chad has already described as, as needing to happen with the schools that he started. You know, Becky, I, I wanna I wanna jump on to what you and um, and Chad were discussing. You know, this idea of getting acceptance from higher ed. So when you think about a kind of nine fourteen or nine sixteen set of institutions that can buy into this. Then you have what I would call a kind of available model. Mm -hmm. And once you have a few available models, whether it's available models about 
a community college to a you know to two year transfer program in the CSU system or to a, a private institution that you've got high schools that Chad is running or that we're supporting, then you can pinpoint that. And then you're on to moving from, do we have something available that works to increasing awareness? And then from awareness to adoption. It's not a, it's a dial, not a switch in my mind. And it takes a few early innovators that come together as a community to move this needle. So I, I want to shift a little bit to the, like, what are we going to replace this with uh, discussion? But I just want to remind uh, our viewers that we're going to take some questions here in a few minutes. So if you've got some questions, you can put those in the question and answer session. We've got a couple in there already, so we'll jump to those. But before we go to the questions, I'd like to get back to like, where, where, what do we, where do we go with this? What, what do we replace it with? And Mackie, you've done a ton of work in sort of broader high school redesign. You've mentioned a couple of times, like we got to kind of go big or go home on this, what, what are we gonna replace this with? How do we make that that switch? Well, so, I, you know, I don't think it takes rocket science to do the redesign. Um, if you think about the pivot to mastery, we're really talking about being able to demonstrate um, in very concrete ways that students actually have grasped onto the state learning standards that exist in every state. And so if you thought about every single learning standard as a sort of a micro credential, mm -hmm. you could actually get a very finely tuned map of what kids actually know. And that I think would be incredibly valuable both back into the secondary school system in K-12 and into all of the other sectors that are consumers of the product that you've been talking about today. And so the first thing I think of is Let's be very transparent about what kids know based on the learning standards that states have already adopted. That would be number one, and it would be transformative. I'm sure other folks have other ideas too. What do you guys think? What do we replace the system with? Well, I, I am uh, I'm aligned with Mackey's play, whether we call it merit badges or some <laughs> mm -hmm. system like that. Let me, let me see if I can just describe one of the initiatives we're working with. Um, with here. So I might as well plug my own community. San Joaquin County, California produces two and a half times the number of grapes as Napa, Sonoma, and Mendocino combined. So there's a there's a there are a lot of grapes here. And we are wanting to ferment the future for a lot of young people. And what we realize when we're trying to do that is it's not about seat time. It's the way in which a, an industry in the let's let's use for my case the Lodi wine growers and wine makers begin to lay a set of skills out. If you have any interest at all in ag and vintnology, and those are finding their ways like into high school classrooms, and when they're in the high school classrooms, you're demonstrating your ability to learn those techniques, whether it's around irrigation or pruning, by being in the field working side by side with a grower or side by side with a vitnologist. And that's what does it. And, and those things don't ever really correlate with the hour per hour Carnegie play. It's a great example. It is. And I and I think another uh, another consideration for us is um, is is the thought or the idea that if if you're going to gain mastery in a math concept, does that actually have to happen in a math class? Uh, and that's not true. And and so what what we've learned too is when you're thinking about pursuing mastery uh, in certain content areas, and you know you know your your curriculum, you know your assessments, evidence based grading, whatever that might be to get you to that. Uh, to that mastery level, we also have to be willing to to allow learning to happen cross curricularly in other areas. And as we've designed new high schools, we're teaching we're teaching classes together, um, and not just math, science, and English social studies. Sometimes we'll put art and math together. We'll put art and science together. We'll put music and math together. Um, and and I, so I think it's not just about mastery in math during math time. Um, but it's but it's even much bigger than that, um, which is why I think we go back to this, whether it's micro credentialing or whatever that might be, 
it's just about mastery of concepts. It doesn't matter when and where or how you get that mastery. Right. I remember a lot of discussion about badging. I still have my scout thing from when I was a kid here where, you know, you fill that, you demonstrated, right? You demonstrated the, the capacity and you had somebody sign up. Like we, you, I used to wave that around as a bottle for where we're going. Um, so let me ask you guys this. You all know that the education landscape is littered with good ideas um, that people spun up. And I, I started my student, uh, my student teaching I did when I started my career was in an open floor plan high school. I, somebody got the idea of having 600 ninth graders in a giant room with no walls or doors was a good idea. They built a whole high school. I, so we know that you know lots of reform ideas have flamed out over the years. How do we know that this is the right approach, especially when we're taking on such an elemental uh, DNA level piece of this work? Like how, how, do, how are we going to demonstrate to people that we have the research and backing and evidence that this will work uh, as we move forward to talk to policymakers and others about this? Well, there is a fair amount of evidence that mastery-based systems can actually grow and thrive. We have the international baccalaureate system at our disposal now. It happens to be situated at, at a very elite level, but the mechanics could be applied anywhere throughout the performance spectrum. And the fact that IB works in whatever it is, 182 countries, mm -hmm. the last time I checked, um, this is a system that already is functioning well and just needs to be calibrated uh, for, for different contexts. The other thing I would say is that it, it opens up the possibility of, of both a different approach to graduation in the sense of being able to demonstrate mm -hmm. that you know something, but also the continuation. If you don't actually end up in full mastery, you can either get a map of your current set of things that you're mastering and map those against the needs of employers and, and other opportunities for training. Or at some point, you can really pinpoint where you need to upskill. And in both of those settings, there's lots and lots of information and evidence that that kind of, of comparative alignment can be very effective, both in mobilizing um, students to actually complete education and to uh, smooth the pathway for students into both uh, higher education, training, military, whatever. I, th I think. I, and I've, I've alluded to this earlier. I mean, I think when you talk about evidence this, that, that this works, I think that um, what we're seeing from school systems that do this, you know, all these other ed reform movements that we've talked about are more about the process to get the right product. And what we're seeing in school systems that, that have abandoned Carnegie units that focus on mastery, that focus on, you know, the profile of a graduate or kids that are that, that the, the product speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really not about the process. And, uh, and so I, I, I feel like we can look to enough, whether that's empirical evidence uh, or just school examples across the country, that, that schools that abandon this notion of Carnegie Unit to focus on, on mastery and product are producing a much different type of graduate um, that are going on, if you track college um, completion rates, are going on to be quite successful at, at the college level. So... Uh let me ask you this. We're in the middle of the pandemic. It's the pandemic is, well, hopefully we're at the end. It pains me to say we're in the middle. Hopefully we're close to the end of the middle. But, you know, it's it's had people uh, asking a lot of questions about our schools and how schools work and thinking about schooling differently. And you've heard about pods and people organizing kids for instruction differently, virtual. What? How are you guys thinking about the impact of the pandemic, does this open the door to this discussion? It, are there pieces that we're seeing there that we can say, you know what, this is demonstrating that if we take some different approaches, we can kind of go to scale in the post-COVID world? How, how do we think the COVID uh, pandemic may be an entry point, or is it uh, to a, a broader discussion here? Well, there's, def there's definitely an appetite for innovation and change. Mm -hmm. In the particular region of California where I am, I, and I don't think that's unique. So, if there's ever a time to capitalize on some mini disruption, this would be the time. I think we'd have to align with what the outcomes are for a community and how a community sees its 
uh, itself. We are particularly uh, challenged by the fact that we we're not the we're not the most beautiful to attract outside talent in. So we have to grow our talent to grow our economy uh, in the area. So this is the kind of innovation that uh, that I think, based on what Chad said, we see as opportunistic. Then I would uh, add to that that uh, my team has been studying uh, what what's happened in the charter school space and with charter school authorizers over the course of the pandemic, and there was a lot of uh, request and granting of waivers to get out from under a lot of this regulatory contractual requirements. Um, and so I, I have to believe that that same flexibility has been granted across the country because there was simply no other way to do so. So we've already demonstrated the capacity to provide flexibility. The other part that is, is I think, really important and both Don and, and Chad have spoken to it is that we also have to step up to agreeing on what the appropriate um, proof points and evidence would be that that flexibility is in fact well-founded. And so the, the appetite for flexibility is out there. The appetite to waive is out there. We just have to have a different conversation about accountability, I think. And then we've got the right building blocks to help move this forward. Yeah, and I couldn't, not to belabor the point, but I couldn't agree more. And I think Arizona is a great example. I talked about the the seat time bill. Um, you know, we, we ran it the year before and didn't nearly have the votes to pass. Uh, and when the pandemic came, everyone said, oh, hey, we need we need different ways yeah. and times to, to get credit. And, and there was almost a rallying cry for this bill to get passed from both sides of the aisle. Um, because we learned that we need flexibility. And now if we can just take that same appetite um, and rethink, it's not because the bill was all about, we need learning can take place in other, other times and other spaces. And now we need to say it can, it can take place in other, in other paces of time, right? Other spaces of time. I can master concepts earlier. I can master them later. I can master them in different ways. And I think, I think the pandemic, if you, if you take what we've learned about needing the flexibility in the waivers and access of technology uh, and leveraging technology, I think more than ever, we can demonstrate mastery in ways like we've never been able to before. Technology has given us new tools to track in real time. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it's great. So I, I want to turn to questions here in, in just another minute. Uh, let me ask you this before we pivot to the question. So where do we start? As we've said there's a lot of moving pieces here. Um, what would be your recommendations for, you know, somebody who's listening here, it's thinking about this, like, what, do we start with the higher eds and the teacher prep programs? Do we start um, with these districts of innovation? Do we start at the elementary schools and work our way up? Do we, what, how, do we how do we get underway here at getting sort of the thousand flowers blooming here in, in terms of change. I, I'm, I'm taken by what Chad was describing um, in Arizona. And I think if I were gonna try to right place that in California, I, I think these are innovation models with high school and community colleges primarily mm -hmm where the community college is focused on the workforce needs yeah. given you know, communities in California that require at least an AA or AS and a meaningful certification or two. You know, I mean, I, I, I think when, when we look at, uh, when we look at the extraordinary need for vet techs mm -hmm. or for irrigation specialists or for drone programming, you know, in the ag business, you know, this is an area where a community college and a set of high schools can rethink the way time is used and the way space is used in our place more. So I, I, uh, I like that mashup of, of higher ed and, mm -hmm. you know, a uh, high school system and similar to what Chad is doing. Mm -hmm. I want to turn the question around to you, Steve. What do you think? Well, I'll, I'll just say what I was saying, we started at the state to just get out of the way. That was the main thing that we thought at the state level we could do. So we did pass some, some statutory changes that 
created some flexibility as, as Chad had said earlier around um, around diploma statutes and those kinds of things and took out anything in statute that mentioned like age-based grade levels, you know, so we tried to just clear the field a little bit. Um, and then we worked on some innovation funding and things like that. So it felt like we did both a top down and then we also supported a group of superintendents uh, who wanted to get together. There was actually a, a group of superintendents in place here in Maine that was working together and kind of sharing ideas about how to do this. So it was a little bit of bringing a kind of set group of innovators along and just supporting them and then trying to clear the road. That's at least from a state policymaker point of view, that's felt like the right uh, moves for us at that level. But uh, happy to hear where else we might. I'm interested in this. Uh, I don't want to pick on the, well, I'll pick on the high schools a little bit. Uh, this idea of starting with the high schools, I think it's fair to say um, that, you know, elementary schools done multi-age for a long time. That seems, you know, you see a lot of that at the elementary level. I'm a middle school guy, the middle schools kind of sort of kid focused. And I think it's probably fair to say that the high schools, I'll, I'll just say here, have been a little more reluctant to sort of embrace these kinds of approaches. Is that a fair, is, is, do we need to focus on high schools? I know high school redesign has been a big chunk of work uh, for a long time. Is, is the, should the high schools be a focus area in the way that Don just described? And Chad, you mentioned. Yeah, no, I I, I mean, I think so. I think, um, I, I, I do think it's, it's challenging to just focus on high schools without talking to, uh, with post-secondary at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and so I, I do think those go hand in hand. And what I also know is that, you know, read, you heard Mackie say earlier, when you start, when you start from scratch, you start a new school, you start a new design, yeah. that's, that, that's easy to launch something without Carnegie units. When yeah. you take a 3000 student urban high school and try mm -hmm. to flip it on its head, uh, I think right. I think that's uh, and we're trying, by the way, uh, we're, we're attempting our first model at breaking up a large school into small schools and thinking about time differently. Um, but I think that's where I think that's where a lot of the heavy lift. And I think in mm -hmm. removing, as you said, providing flexibility at the state level, these these mm -hmm. seat time flexibility bills yep. uh, and maybe some financial incentives to say, hey, we, give us a try. Uh, here's the support. I think that'll go a long way as well. All right, so let me uh, bring up a couple of questions here from our group. Um, one of the themes I've got a note here, uh, what does this mean for teacher workforce? Wouldn't we need to think totally differently about teacher preparation or any of the incentives for teacher performance lined up for this type of thinking? Is that baked into contracts? How do we tackle the, the, the teacher piece? Because obviously this is a big shift in sort of the way teachers are organized, the kind of instruction they do, the kind of assessment and, and adjusting that they're doing on a like, what do we do with the teacher pipeline piece on this? I have a lot of ideas about this. <laughs> okay. No. I don't need a lot. I only need a couple. Minutes. All right. I'm only going to mention one or two. Uh, <laughs> but okay. let me just say that we're already rethinking the role of teachers in classrooms. Um, and part of that is of necessity that we're seeing a dwindling supply of, of teachers coming into the profession. And part of it is a recognition that many teachers are faced with a wider range of challenge in their students yeah. than they have normally been experienced yeah. or trained to handle. So we're already halfway there. Um, if you look at examples like Khan Academy, where it's a flipped resource, mm -hmm. where you know a, a student can go anywhere in the learning continuum and start and pick up, the role of a teacher turns into a diagnostician and a remover of barriers as opposed mm -hmm. to a standard right. And I think that that is actually the most professional aspect of the job. And I would imagine from the teachers that I've spoken with, the most satisfying as well. So I think that transition is eminently feasible. Mm -hmm. Whether or not we can get the system to accept that is a different challenge, is a different question. Yeah, I, I do remember talking, visiting a school district that was doing a lot of this work and talking to a young teacher who said, you know, I came here and we we're doing all this innovative stuff and no more seventh grade and, you know, kids moving on. To, she goes, when I was at the prep school, we didn't talk about any of this. Like, this was brand new. Like, I, we were doing none of this in the prep programs. Um, so it does feel like, is that a set of work we're going to need to focus on is, is some rethinking of our prep programs? I think two uh, two quick thoughts on that. Uh, number one, it, was, it just reminded me of uh, a phrase I heard that came out of Singapore's uh, educational system, which they had, a, they had a tagline of teach less, learn more. 
you know, is this idea of like reminding teachers that it's not just about how much content you're, you're verbally giving your kids, but how are you guiding your kids to the right learning? Um, and so I, I do think there's a, there's a little bit of a shift in what the role of a teacher is, as Mackie kind of alluded to, and what does that look like? What does that feel like? Um, and then kind of that second comment about prep programs, we've, in all these schools, schools that we're designing and launching, we announced last year that we're uh, launching an educator prep high school. And um, uh, we have a couple other schools that we're designing right now. In fact, one is called PXU City. It's a school that uh, it's an all independent study high school. Uh, the city's your classroom, no time, no space, no place. Kids and families can literally design their own high school experience. Uh, that's coming the fall, that's coming next year, but the year after is this ed prep high school. And the idea is that we need to train a different type of teacher. Um, and uh, we need to think very differently about prep programs. And, and we're going to try to do that a little bit in high school. You know, Chad, we, I, I think we were separated at birth. So we just, <laughs> uh, we just launched a, uh, a new small early college high school called Teach. And, uh, and it launched with ninth graders, 35 of them. Uh, we got buy-in. It's a, it's a small charter school. We got buy-in from all the districts because they could see that if kids from their communities went to this, they could come back as teachers and completely re-looking at, you know, the Carnegie unit just is not going to stand for uh, in this program and the way in which the curriculum is being designed in concert with, you know, Cal State status loss and a, a real pathway. So good for you. All right, I've got another question here as we're starting to, people are taking apart this idea a little bit at sort of a piece of time because there's a lot, right? Um, one of the things we talked on, uh, touched on is measurement. Won't this line of thinking result in more testing? If you are going to be moving kids on attainment of mastery or competency, that means sort of constant assessment of where kids are and then grouping and regrouping with kids for instruction based on where they are in their mastery. Um, is this going to be more testing? Is it going to be end of testing? We know there's a testing sort of pushback nationally, at least in large scale testing. Um, so either this results in measuring things consistently to gauge mastery skills instead of time, or at least to measuring nothing objectively that doesn't feel that doesn't feel like a good thing either. What's how, how do we do this in the right way where we are assessing where kids are and moving them on achievement of these skills? Well, I think there's there's two different parts to the question. One mm -hmm. is, should we measure what kids actually know? There's an implicit question there. And mm -hmm. I, I will take the stand that the answer is yes, um, both from a, a fairness and objective, compassionate view for the students' uh, welfare themselves, but also from uh, the standpoint that uh, K-12 education is one of the largest public funded investments that we make in our society. And we want to know that we can find ways to make, uh, make that better for, for individuals, communities, and for our society. So yes, I think measurement is good. Um, the question is also, I think, a little bit implicit that we have a specific model of testing that says, we heard you into the cafeteria for three days in the spring and we lock the door and we don't let yeah. you out. Yeah. And let me just say, I don't think that that is the only way that we could think about actually getting objective and mm -hmm. fair measures of what kids know. So there's, in, in all of the ways that the rest of, of, of K-12 education has been disrupted by, by COVID, the assessment system has been blown to smithereens as well. Yes. And so we have a moment there also to be doing some rethinking and redesign. Yeah, and I, and I do, I was just, just quickly, I, I mean, I do agree if, we, if, if there is a perception uh, that this is more testing uh, or more summative or more standardized, I, I think uh, that'll ruin really the, the purity of this model. That's not what this is all about. Um, mm -hmm. This is about finding unique ways to capture mastery, and you can demonstrate mastery in many ways. We should be constantly assessing along the way because we need to, if it's about mastery, we need to know where kids have mastered and where they haven't. And how do you regroup and redesign uh, to get to mastery? And, and so I, I think this is, 
uh, the opposite of that approach. This is about finding unique ways to demonstrate mastery along a learning journey instead of waiting toward these major points, hurting you into a cafeteria, uh, improving in three hours that you understand math. Uh, that doesn't work anymore. So let me pivot off that because the challenge is, as you guys know, we talked about state policymakers and even local leaders. At the top of the pyramid here are our friends in Washington who are insisting, you know, under law that we do this testing every year for certain grade levels. I mean, that model, that grade level model is locked in. So if we're building schools that don't have age-based grade levels in them, how do we square what we've just said about sort of through course and ongoing assessment with this desire that we have nationally and bipartisanly, I think, um, to have these really regular, large scale, herd them into the cafeteria for three hours type assessments? What, what, what do we say to uh, our friends in Washington who are, are pretty adamant that that model needs to stay in place or some version of it? In a life? <laughs> <laughs> with me, but you, build it out a little bit. Give me a little more. Than that. <laughs> I think my, my colleagues also have something to add to that. Yeah. Sorry, well, go ahead. Ted. Yeah, I no, Don, I, go for it. Yeah, yeah, I think look, I I think we are gonna have to acknowledge that the kids who are being prepared in a competency based program will probably either A, be as prepared to take some pile in the cafeteria, take a test, or if they are not and love the program they're doing, they're probably going to take some, they're probably going to be committed and the system's going to be committed to taking some hours out to prepare their youngsters to do well in those assessments. You got to, you, 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 you got to, uh, you got to win the game you know, on the corner mm -hmm. of the realm. And if it takes that way, I mean, this was, you know, your initial uh, question, uh, Steve, you know, about the early days of the charter movement. We, yeah. we, we, we had to win on tests we didn't completely believe in, but we had to win. So I've got a question here um, about the equity challenge that we have here. So I, you know, we've certainly seen states and you know, in my position at CCS, so we ran the Innovation Lab Network for a number of years, worked with state local partnerships with a series of states to do this work. I think the challenges is in every challenges were that in every state you had sort of high capacity districts that were well resourced that could execute all of the pieces we've been talking about: new assessment systems, new teacher training programs figuring out how to rework the school day, figuring out how to communicate all of this to parents, engage partnerships, talk to business partners. I mean, we're talking about a lot of pieces to take on. We know that all school districts are not equitably resourced to do this. So I've got a question here about a concern that are we, are we fostering greater inequity if we have sort of well-resourced, high capacity, uh, high competency, whatever we want to describe them, districts kind of going off and doing their competency-based models. And the, you know, up here in Maine, we've got rural districts with 60 kids in them. Like, how do, how do we solve the equity challenge if we really intend to go to scale here and change this whole system in such a dramatic way? So uh, maybe I'll make a couple of opening comments. Um, I, I think if we do this right, it gets at equity mm -hmm. uh, and it levels the playing field. And uh, if you if you look at uh, Phoenix, where, where I'm at today, we we're the largest low income district of color uh, right in our state. So we're, we're nearly 90 percent for introduced lunch rate, 97 percent students of color, 100 languages, 50 tribal communities. We're you know, we're, we're the city center urban district. And yet we actually think this is the answer to equity uh, and to really think about designing programs and schools and pathways that uh, that meet the needs of all students. Um, and uh, I, I, I mean, I, I think it's a great question because sometimes we do see innovation in more well-resourced districts. Mm -hmm. I think that's why I, I mentioned earlier and you did too, Steve, that sometimes you have to incentivize financially yeah. some of this. And, and I think if we can bend that toward districts that maybe are under-resourced, but have the appetite for innovation, I think that could also get at, get at mm -hmm. uh, equity. 
So maybe recognizing that as school funding formulas or something to innovation. Absolutely. Funding, those, those kinds of things. So states could take an active role. So, hey, Chad, I'm, I'm just, uh, <laughs> I'd love to try my thought on you and, and Mackie and, uh, and Steve is, in, in my mind, the, the communities that are most resourced to do this are the most challenged to want to do. So I'm going to, you, you know, so I'm like the last, like I'm really trying to imagine Palo Alto High School right. shifting. Right. They, have, they probably have access to all the money they need. Right. That's but zero incentive. To, yeah. Yeah. But to, but to make that change there or a change in, you know, a 4,000 student comprehensive urban high school somewhere is uh, is far more difficult and probably not enough money than a you know more rural mid-sized you know semi-rural high school that wants mm -hmm. to do this because their the context of that community is more open to it so how do we get you know, how do we get resources to those places yeah. that are much more the first ones to try it? Like, like, like if we were trying to, you know, imagine what are the archetypes that are most ready and least ready, some of the least ready would be the most financially capable. Right. Well, I can also say from work that we've done here at Stanford that uh, the even within cities across the country, there are variations in the uh, adequacy of the instruction that's happening um, at the high school level and even in other, other levels of schools. And so I do think that there is, in fact, even in under-resourced communities, I think there is there are the conditions that lead to the kind of outcry and public opinion that Don was speaking at at, about at the very beginning of our hour and the uh, professional will to try new things mm -hmm. that that Chad is bringing to, to Phoenix. So I don't think this is an either or situation. What I think right. is going to happen is that it's going to percolate in a hundred different places mm -hmm. and we're going to have to go and look at all of them and figure out what are the best features that they've yep. been able to come up with so that we can put a playbook together to make it a, a more broad uh, adoption. So so hold up some models of how a, a really diverse set of districts did this work. Right? So guys, I, I hate to, to cut us off here. By my clock, we get two minutes. So um, would I welcome any last minute words of wisdom from the panel here, words of encouragement for our Viewers, what would you like to leave as a kind of a last takeaway as we wrap up here? I'm going to jump on something that has nothing to do specifically with our discussion, but I just want to, to thank everyone who wrote questions for this. There are some phenomenal questions, and mm -hmm. we're going to capture those and put that on the website with answers to them. So stay tuned. If you didn't get your question answered, you will. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think my what I have learned uh more so as a result of this conversation is, you know, you got to find like-minded folks and go together. So I'm, I'm flying to Phoenix soon. <laughs> Great, Don. And uh, Steve Sells now would love to join us if uh, if and when you, you you land in Phoenix. So That would be perfect, Chad. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don's going to show up at your house for dinner, Chad. So, uh, perfect. Perfect. Ready. I'll be ready. All right. Well, great. Well, um, we are out of time, but I really, really want to thank our panelists. It feels like we just sort of bit off a little tiny piece of a really, really big, complicated discussion here, but some great stuff. Really, really appreciate uh, you guys being with us today. And I want to thank everybody who's joined the webinar today. Uh, we're going to post a recording of the session on the Hoover Education Success Initiative site shortly uh, on the homepages at hoover.org if you'd like to Revisit the session, share it with your friends. Uh, you can also find recordings of the other installments of the series um, that are one already uh, in the books and, and more to come. Uh, so we hope you'll join us for those. And uh, next week, specifically at 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific, for Fourth Estate or Fifth Wheel, the role of media and education reform. Love that. I'm tuning in just for the title. I just love the title. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> thanks again to the panelists and thank all of you for attending. We really appreciate it and, and best of luck for everybody. Take care. Thanks all. Bye.